Hi there. So today I want to talk to you about um, if everything is a wave, what's waving? So we're going to talk about wave particle duality and a little history of the hydrogen atom. For those of you that have had modern physics, this will be a review, but hey, reviews are never bad and sometimes it gives you a new perspective on the material. So J.J. Thompson um, first measured the charge to mass ratio of the electron. And based upon his work and other theories that were popular at the time, he postulated that the atom was much like a British plum pudding. So you had a positively charged dough, and within that dough were embedded the electrons, which were the negatively charged raisins in the plum pudding. Now, Rutherford, Ernest Rutherford, came along a little bit later and did some measurements um, with gold foil. And in his gold foil experiment, what he did was he bombarded um, this little very thin piece of gold foil with a beam of alpha particles, which are, um, of course, helium atoms that have been ionized with no electrons. So basically, he hit these um, alpha particles at the gold foil, and he measured the particles that were scattered off um, of this interaction with the gold foil. And he saw that a very small number, but a measurable number, of those alpha particles pretty much hit the gold foil and bounced straight back. And based upon this, he said, and this is a quote, it was quite the most incredible event that has ever happened to me in my life. It was almost as incredible as if you fired a 15 inch shell at a piece of tissue paper and it came back and hit you. On consideration, I realized that this scattering backward must be the result of a single collision. And when I made the calculations, I saw that it was impossible to get anything of that order of magnitude unless you took a system in which the greater part of the mass of the atom was concentrated in a minute nucleus. And it was then that I had the idea of an atom with a minute massive center carrying a charge. So based upon the fact that these um, alpha particles scattered straight back from a very, very thin piece of gold foil, he postulated upon the model of the atom that is shown here. And it's kind of a planetary model. Okay, So if you think of the sun at the center of our solar system and the planets orbiting that sun, then this is really similar to Rutherford's postulate for what an atom would look like. He imagined a very dense, positively charged nucleus with the electrons orbiting it. But even right away, people realized that there were problems with this model of the atom. And that was that it was known that accelerating charges radiate energy. Okay, So if you have an electron orbiting a nucleus, then it's constantly accelerating because it's traveling in a circle. And that would mean that it would constantly have to be radiating, radiating away energy. And as it did that, if it radiates energy away, then by a conservation of energy, it should lose that energy, and eventually it would just spiral in towards the center of the nucleus, and bang, no more atom. So that was the problem, and people realized it right away. There was another problem with that model. It couldn't explain why, in uh, the spectrum of light that came out of an excited gas, that there were very discrete lines with distinct colors and frequencies. Okay, couldn't explain that either. So along came this guy right here, okay, Bohr. Um, what he postulated was that there were certain allowed orbits of the electrons around the nucleus, okay? These orbits were the only ones that were allowed, and because the uh, size of the orbit was quantized, then that led to the quantization of the energy of the orbit as well, okay? And that led to the discrete lines that one saw in these excited gas spectra, okay? If the energy is quantized for the orbit, then the color of the light that comes out of that is quantized. So what would happen is the electrons would be in a certain orbit and then they would receive energy for some reason and if they received the right amount of energy then they would jump up to the next allowed orbit. They would remain in that orbit for a little while but then they would want to decay back to their ground state and when they decayed they would jump from say the first excited state back to the ground state and then they would emit a photon of energy that had that exact energy difference. And that explained the spectrum of hydrogen. Now, the model mostly worked, but no one could really effectively explain why there were only certain orbits that were allowed. Okay? Now, in sort of a parallel plane of uh, discovery that was going on around at the turn of the 1800s to the 1900s, 
There was a lot of interest in this phenomenon known as the photoelectric effect. The photoelectric effect is that if you shine high energy light, like ultraviolet light, at a metal surface, that electrons will be emitted from that surface. And this became known as the photoelectric effect. Photo um, from the light, and then the electric from the electrons that came off. Well, no one could successfully explain the theory behind the photoelectric effect until Albert Einstein came along and put forth his postulate. And his idea was that if you treat the incoming light not as a wave, but as a particle, and that the energy of that particle had a value of hf, where h is Planck's constant, 6.626 times 10 to the minus 34 joule seconds is Planck's constant, and f is the frequency of the light. If instead of treating the light as a wave, you treated it as a particle with that energy hf, that you could explain the photoelectric effect. What would happen is the light particle would come in, it would strike the surface, it would give the um, metal atom that amount of energy that it had, E is equal to HF. That amount of energy would be enough to free an electron from being bound to the atom, kick it off, and then give it a certain amount of kinetic energy. And that was the explanation that worked for the photoelectric effect. Basically, Einstein was treating light not as a wave, which it had been previously assumed that light was, but as a particle, and that it would interact with the surface kind of like a billiard ball strikes another billiard ball and gives it a certain amount of kinetic energy. Now, this man right here, Louis de Broglie, he said, well, if light can be both a particle and a wave. Why can't a particle be both a particle and a wave? All right? And he said, well, what wavelength would these particles have? Well, the particles would have a wavelength corresponding to lambda, which is the wavelength, is equal to Planck's constant that we discussed earlier, h, divided by the momentum of that particle. Classically, the momentum is the mass times the velocity. Okay. Um, of course, relativistically, you would have to factor in the gamma, but we're just going to deal with classical particles for now. Now, this idea is the foundation of quantum mechanics, all of it. Every single bit of quantum mechanics comes from this idea that particles can be waves. The wave nature of matter is the reason we have quantum mechanics. Almost everything about quantum theory is based on this idea, and it's really hard to overstate how important this idea is to modern physics. But for such an important big deal, it's a tiny little wavelength. For example, if you took a 4,000 pound car, it's got a mass of about 1,800 kilograms. If that car is driving at 60 miles per hour, or 27 meters per second, then you can calculate what the de Broglie wavelength of that um, car particle would be. And it's a tiny little number, 1.4 times 10 to minus 38 meters. And that's a factor of 8 times 10 to 27 times smaller than the hydrogen atom. So it seems like this is an idea that really doesn't matter at all. Well, for a little thing, right, it can actually have a really big impact if you're dealing with other little tiny things. So for something the size of a car, this wavelength is completely something that you can ignore and it's totally unimportant. But when you get to something like an electron, for example, if you accelerate an electron with 30,000 volts to a speed of 100 million meters per second, then you get a wavelength that's about 7 picometers. Now that still seems pretty small, but it's a lot bigger than the wavelength that the car had because the particle's mass is a lot smaller. But also, even though this is a tiny number, it's a lot bigger than the electron itself. So it matters a lot because comparatively speaking, the electron's wave is bigger than the electron, which we kind of think of as a point particle. All right, now, why is it important that particles have a wave nature? Well, waves can do things that particles can't do, right? If you think about your classical physics, waves can refract and they can diffract. Now, waves diffract because they can do something that particles can't. Two waves can be in the same place at the same time. When this happens, the waves actually interfere with one another. So what interference is, let's say that you have two waves, like wave one and wave two here, and they're lined up so that the peaks and the troughs match up. If you added those together, then you would have what's called constructive interference. And instead of two little waves, for example, you might have one big wave. So the two waves interfere. That means that they obey the superposition principle, and they add together. 
okay? Now, however, if you have a scenario like you have over here on the other side, where you have the peak of the wave lining up with the trough of the wave, then that would sum to zero. And that's called destructive interference, okay? So waves can constructively and destructively interfere with one another. And that creates the diffraction pattern that you see. Now, it's pretty well known, I hope you're all aware of the fact that light can diffract and create a diffraction pattern. So, for example, if I pass a laser beam through a narrow slit, then that narrow slit acts as a point source and it spreads out the wave front, okay? When that happens, you can get interference patterns that look like these over here on the right. If you have a single slit, then you get a bright central maximum with some weaker spots on either side. And if you have two slits, then you get this really sort of interesting looking interference pattern over here. And that's because as it acts like the point source, what happens is you get waves, neighboring waves, constructively and destructively interfering with one another. And geometri geometrically, you can prove that it adds up to be this cool little pattern that you see, where you get these dark and light alternating bands due to the constructive and destructive interference. Okay? I'm not going to go into that mathematics here. It's a topic for another course, specifically modern physics. However, it is something that's pretty easy to show geometrically. Now, if light can do that, then via wave particle duality, particles should be able to do that too. And in fact, they do. If you shoot a beam of electrons at a double slit, then you can show that you're going to get an interference pattern that looks very, very similar to the one that you would get for a laser beam. This has been shown numerous times experimentally and proven to be true. In fact, here's a little simulation of that. If a detector, for example, set at some distance away from two slits, and then you shoot an electron beam at those two slits, and then you show what happens over time, then it adds up to be this familiar looking double slit interference pattern that is shown here. Okay, And it becomes clearer as the number of electrons reaching the screen increases. So you can experimentally show that particles act like waves in that they uh, refract and defract just like um, just like waves do. Now there's another thing that happens to waves. For example, if you have a wave and you confine it to a certain region of space, then what's called a standing wave will form. And this is the physics that underlines a lot of musical instruments. So for example, if you have a guitar string and you pluck that guitar string, then you'll see standing waves form in the guitar, guitar string if you have one of those um, high-speed cameras. Okay, and then you can freeze frame uh, and superimpose multiple exposures and you might get a pattern similar to what you see here, where you have um, a standing wave that's clearly formed on this string. All right, that's of course why pinning the string down with your finger on the frets changes the pitch of the note because you're changing the region to which the wave is confined and that changes the wavelength and hence the frequency of the note. How does it do it? Well, here, okay, let's show this. Let's say that you have a wave like a guitar string wave, okay? And the guitar string has a certain length to it, and it's held at the ends so that it's not allowed to wiggle at the ends. So that means that if you just pluck it and you get the simplest wave out, you're going to get a maximum amplitude here in the center, and then all these other little lines in the middle show all the other positions that the string can be in as it vibrates up and down. So that fixes the wavelength of the string. It can either vibrate like this where it's fixed at the ends, or it can have two humps or three humps, but either way, it's going to vibrate in one of these set patterns. So the wavelength is fixed. The wavelength would be two times the length of the string divided by n, where n would be the mode of oscillation. Okay. And then, because lambda times f is equal to the velocity of the wave, because you know the wavelength of the wave, you also know what the frequency of the wave is. And of course, the frequency of the wave determines the pitch of the sound that you hear that comes from the guitar string. Okay? Now, de Broglie actually explained why Bohr's model of the atom worked for the hydrogen atom. Okay? Now, it became known later that um, de Broglie and Bohr weren't quite right, and a guy named Schrodinger came along with his equation and sort of corrected their model of the hydrogen atom with quantum mechanics. But this conceptually is still a very good aid in helping us understand what's going on with the electrons in the hydrogen atom. See, the confined wave will soon become a standing wave. 
right? All the other waves are going to cancel out through destructive interference, and then this envelope, this standing wave envelope, is what's going to be formed. So what de Broglie said was, well, the reason that only certain orbits are allowed in that Bohr model of the hydrogen atom is because destructive interference happens at every other position. And so standing waves are formed only at these certain radii. Perfect, right? So here's what happens. Here's your nucleus. Here's your electron. It goes through uh, its wave, and these nodes and these antinodes are formed. The standing wave is formed. And only the ones where constructive interference happens are the ones that survive, right? And those are the orbits that live. And that's why we have quantized energy levels in the hydrogen atom. And that's why you only see certain colors come out of light when you excite hydrogen gas. All right, well. You might be thinking to yourself, fun, particles can act like waves, great. But if matter is a wave, then what's waving, right? What is waving in a matter wave? Well, a lot of people automatically assume that it's like the particle itself, that the particle's position is sort of bobbing up and down as it moves along. But that's just not the case, okay? Electrons aren't wiggling like that. They actually travel in straight lines, unless there's a magnetic field there, which causes them to bend according to the Lorentz force law equation, f is equal to qv cross b, or unless there's an electric field that accelerates them along some line, right? So they travel in straight, straight lines without those electric and magnetic fields. They just travel straight through. So if it's not the position that's waving for a matter wave, then what is waving? Well, maybe we should ask this guy right here. This is Erwin Schrodinger. And he came up with this um, equation right here, which is known as the one-dimensional Schrodinger equation um, uh, when it's time independent, okay? He's best known as one of the creators of quantum mechanics. He did a lot of work in other fields, too, though. Now, this equation that he came up with can't be derived. It's a new fundamental equation that describes the physics of what happens um, with matter waves. It can't be justified. Uh, you can justify it, but you can't experimentally prove it. Don't let that bow tie fool you, by the way. That guy was uh, a real player, um, which is maybe a topic for another day. Now, the wave function, what it does for you, it determines the likelihood or the probability of finding a particle at a particular position in space at a given time. That's what Schrodinger's equation helps you do. It uses the wave function and solves for where that electron, for example, might be at any given time. So if you study the Schrodinger equation really quick, let's look at each one of these terms in the Schrodinger equation. So there, h bar, that's Planck's constant, which is just Planck's constant h divided by 2 pi. m is the mass of the particle in question. This d squared dx squared, that's the second derivative with respect to the position x of the wave function of the particle. The wave function of the particle is described by this pitchfork looking thing here, psi, okay, the Greek letter psi. Now this u is the potential energy of how the particle is being confined, okay? So for example, if it's a particle being confined uh, to a hydrogen atom, an electron being confined to a hydrogen atom potential, then it would be the attractive force between the um, nucleus and the electron that help holds it in confinement. Okay, So that's the potential energy for whatever function is confined in there. And then E is the energy of the particle. All right. So the Schrodinger equation basically relates the probability wave function here, psi, okay, to the spatial coordinate and to the energy of the confinement. So the wave function psi determines the likelihood or the probability of finding a particle at a particular position in space at some given time. All right. Now it turns out that if you solve Schrodinger's equation, for a one-dimensional box so that you assume that your particle is confined to a certain particular region of space in one dimension at a certain time, then what you're going to get is basically the same thing that you see in classical mechanics for those guitar strings that you've plucked. You see a standing wave forming, and it looks exactly like the solution to the standing wave on the string. All right? And so here's your wave function. Right? There's your wave function solutions. And then the square of the wave function gives you the probability of the particle's location. And that's what that looks like. Okay? So 
What you've seen now is a situation where only certain frequencies of oscillation are allowed. That led to quantization. Quantization is a common occurrence when waves are subject to boundary condition. And quantization is also what happens to matter waves or de Broglie waves. The particles are confined to potential, which means they're confined to a region of space. That confinement leads to standing waves, and those standing waves lead to quantization of energy. The difference between the waves on the string and the guitar and the confinement of the electron to a box is simply this. What's waving in the case of a guitar string is the guitar string itself, its position, its vibrating up and down. But for an electron being confined to a, uh, a hydrogen atom, what's waving is the probability of its existence okay, in certain regions of space. And that dictates where the particle can actually be confined to. If you solve Schrodinger's equation for the hydrogen atom potential, and you project that in two dimensions, then you get some wave functions that look like this. If you've had chemistry, these might look kind of familiar as the orbitals, the s, p, d, and f orbitals that you see for electrons um, in atoms. So you have these sort of spherical orbitals, you have the dumbbell-shaped or orbitals, and then you have the double dumbbells and other really cool shapes that come out. What you've seen here, what you're seeing here, are the probability of the particle's locations, right? In this image, the really bright spots are high probability areas, and the dark spots mean that the electron is very unlikely to be there. Now this is a two-dimensional projection. If you try to come up with a 3D representation of what those orbits for the electron and the hydrogen atom look like, they look more like this, right? So here you'd have either a sphere, that's kind of boring so I didn't show that one, but you also can have sort of like a donut or a mushroom cloud or one of these really cool blast ring looking things that you would see, okay? So that's what the orbitals of an electron look like. Now I've got a question for you and it's kind of a doozy. If the electron cloud gives the places that the electrons can be found in an atom, and let's say that this orbital that's being shown here holds at most two electrons, okay? Most two electrons can be held in this orbital. But you see here what this looks like in space. You've got this sort of, uh, sort of D-shaped thing right here, and then you have a ring and then another D-shaped thing. How do the electrons get from here to here to here? That idea is very non-classical. Okay, so what happens is this is actually the electron's probability of location and it's sort of winking in and out of existence. So it's here and then it's here and then it's there and it just winks in and out of existence um, in those different locations. So what's waving? Well, it sounds like what's really waving is the very existence of the particle. The existence of the particle itself is what's waving. So is this a totally crazy idea? Well, maybe not, if you really think about photons, light, and particles as being sort of the same thing. Let's think about what light is. Light is an oscillating, self-propagating electromagnetic wave. Here's a little conception, an artist's conception, of what a light wave would look like, where the electric field is represented by the red arrows, and the magnetic field is represented by the blue arrows. So you can see that as it propagates through space and time, the electric field is kind of oscillating up and down as it moves through space, right? Now the wave intensity is given as some constants times the square of that electromagnetic field. So in a light interference pattern, say for example if we go back to the laser beam idea being diffracted through a single or a double slit, the bright spots in the, laser, in the light interference pattern have a large intensity and the black spots have zero intensity. So if you think about it, right, the fields, the electric fields, they wink in and out of existence and we don't seem to have a problem with that. And you can think of the dark regions in a diffraction pattern as waves that are summing to nothing, right? So what that means is if wave-particle duality is true and it works for particles and not just light, it should be the same. That the particles themselves wink in and out of existence depending upon the value of their wave function psi. Pretty cool, huh? Now, this is an entirely a new idea. Michael Faraday invented the idea of magnetic fields to help explain induction. 
And it was said here, most view field lines as intangible abstractions. Faraday, however, felt that they represented more, that space containing magnetic lines of force was no longer empty, but it acquired certain physical properties. And in 1846, he actually speculated that light was just a wave propagating along such lines. So even in 1846, Michael Faraday was on to the idea that out of nothing can come something. And if you think about it, <clears throat> the Dirac C, um, Dirac was a very great physicist who solved um, the uh, idea of quantum mechanics for uh, relativistic speeds. And he came up with this equation here. And his postulate was that if you picture the universe, as a vacuum, but you don't picture the vacuum as nothing. You picture it as an infinite sea of particles that just have a negative energy state. And then in order to come into existence, all you have to do is give that particle some energy. And then it will dig itself out of that well, okay, and it will go from nothing to existence and being something. And pair production is a real thing. So for example, if you take a gamma ray, okay, which is light, and you pass it by a nucleus, right, you pass it by a nucleus, then that gamma ray, satisfying energy and momentum conservation, will decay into both a positron and an electron, the particle of the electron and its antiparticle. So you can go from having a wave, which has a mass of nothing, convert that energy of that photon, that high energy gamma ray photon, into something, into mass. And then you can take from something, from nothing, and create something with mass. And this happens in the lab repeatedly, over and over again. It's been proven to be true. So, nothing is really something. Maybe that's the lesson for today. <laughs>